Good morning, friends. My name is Jeremy Rutledge, and I'm senior pastor at Circular Congregational Church. And it's just my delight to welcome you to our online morning worship on this beautiful summer morning here in the Low Country. We say in the spirit of our progressive and inclusive faith that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome in our community. And we're always glad to gather together in that spirit of inclusion and welcome. We like to symbolize that spirit by taking a moment to pass a word of peace. And these days, as we're meeting uh, virtually at a distance, we may pass the peace by texting a peaceful word to someone or simply whispering a quiet, peaceful prayer for someone we may be thinking of. So I invite you, each in your own way, uh, to take a moment and pass the peace. I'd also like to invite you to join us after church for a very special coffee hour. Uh, this is being done by Zoom, so in order to join the coffee hour, you need to check your email or the church app or the church newsletter, and you'll find instructions on how to join the church coffee hour. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from tribe leaders. Our tribes are named after the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, but those are geographic groupings of circular members. Just lets you know who's near to you uh, as we take care of each other through this pandemic time. And we'll also be welcoming our newest members uh, with a litany of welcome and a celebration of the newest members joining our community. We'll be doing that on Zoom during the coffee hour and we'll read a litany of commitment and welcome and we'll see our newest members and celebrate together. So I hope you can join us after this service on Zoom. So now that we've gathered ourselves and passed a word of a peace, shared a brief announcement, let me invite you to join me in grounding ourselves for the hour of worship, simply by taking a deep breath together. And let's center ourselves where we are on this good morning feeling the tie that binds us together, and giving thanks for this day. We join our hearts and our spirits in worship. We light this candle as a symbol of the mystery that is within us, among us, and at the same time beyond us. This mystery brings us together as one, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, we are one. Hello, my name is Chris Hernandez, and I am serving as the liturgist for today's service. Let us begin our time together with the call to worship as written by Reverend Jeremy Rutledge. We gather to worship in the presence of mystery. We have all felt it, as William Wordsworth said, rolling through all things. We have all seen it, as Mary Oliver said, in the faces of the tulips. We have all tried to name it, as Vassar Miller said, our tongues mum and mumbling. And as we gather to worship in the presence of mystery, let us remember what we have felt and seen and together learned better than to try and name.
Kristen Johnson and I'm going to be doing children's time today. So lately I've been thinking a lot about puzzles and sometimes puzzles can be big like this and take a long time and are kind of hard to do. And sometimes puzzles can be like this. They're smaller, still kind of tricky, but they take less time. And sometimes puzzles can be things that are in our head, things that we think about, um, that we're working on, not necessarily problems, but just things we think about. And we can use our imagination to work on those puzzles. And some of those puzzles that you might be working on now with you and your grown up in your house are things like, what's school gonna look like for me? And when can I go to my best friend's house for a play date? And why do I have to keep wearing this mask? And all those are puzzles that you can think about in your head. And sometimes our imagination helps us solve those puzzles. And sometimes our imagination makes us think about not the best answers to those puzzles. So I have an idea for you when you're solving a puzzle and if that puzzle's in your head and in your imagination, or if that puzzle's a really quick and easy puzzle, or if that puzzle is a really big, long puzzle that takes a long time, it's always best if you ask for help because it makes it more fun and easier to solve. So, Moving forward this week, if you're thinking about something in your imagination and you don't have an answer for it, ask someone in your family to help you by talking about it. Have a great week. Bye. And now at this time, I will present the prayer of confession. When I was writing this prayer, I was thinking about different ways that my family and I'm sure many other families and communities around the country and around the world have found different ways to maintain close connections during the past several months. And thinking about those creative ways that we've maintained our close relationships, I'd like to invite us to consider ways to think about our relationship with God and with the greater mysteries in the world and how that can change our outlook on life and how we build a greater beloved community. So with all that in mind, please join me in prayer. To the one who is light, love, and life everlasting, we come to you in a world where things are changing. Man-made rules are being rewritten our awareness of life and its connectivity is evolving. We are reminded that church is not simply a building that may stand empty at this moment. It is the commitment of a group of people to search for truth, work for justice, and grow in compassion. We are reminded that while families may not be able to show each other love in person, true bonds of familial love find ways to embrace beyond any quarantine or separation. We are reminded that even in a time when public institutions are strained and society seems fractured, new beloved community is growing through inspired individuals reaching out to strangers and neighbors alike. To the one who is the living mystery, ground us in the everyday miracles around us. The sunrise that scatters a billion photons of light across a multi-hued sky, the pulses of electricity that fire every few milliseconds through each neuron in our brains, the tiny wind-tossed seed 
that grows to be a towering oak and, and provides shelter for a menagerie of organisms. May the complexities and vast unknowns of our existence give us room to grow in love and imagine a greater, holy society grounded in compassion and understanding. Remind us that heaven is not high above or far away, but it is within us, here and now. On this day, we pray that we may be healed of corporeal disease and mental anguish. Give us the courage to speak up for justice. We ask for the prudence to use our gifts and talents, to live with compassion, act with kindness, and build a world enclosed in peace. Amen. Thou shalt scripture this morning. Our scripture is from Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 through 15, from the Inclusive Bible. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Medean. Leading the flock deep into the wilderness, Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The messenger of God appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a thorn bush. Moses saw the bush is ablaze with fire, and yet it is not consumed. Moses said, Let me go over and look at this remarkable sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When God saw Moses coming to look more closely, God called out to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, I am here. God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, the voice continued, the God of Sarah and Abraham, the God of Rebekah and Isaac, the God of Leah and Rachel and Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at the Holy One. And then God said, I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries under those who oppress them. I have felt their sufferings. Now I have come down to rescue them from the hand of Egypt, out of their place of suffering, and bring them to a place that is wide and fertile, a land flowing with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the children of Israel has reached me, and I have watched how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now go, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? 
God answered, I will be with you. And this is the sign by which you will know that it is I who have sent you. After you bring my people out of Egypt, you will all worship at this very mountain. But Moses said, when I go to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. If they ask me, what is this God's name? What am I to tell them? God replied, I am as I am. This is what you will tell the Israelites. I am has been sent to you. God spoke further to Moses. Tell the children of Israel, God the I am, the God of your ancestors, the God of Sarah and Abraham, of Rebekah and Isaac, of Leah and Rachel and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is the name you are to remember for all generations. May we hear the wisdom in the words. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone. And welcome back to uh, my home library, where I'll be offering the morning teaching. If you're a kid and you're listening for the key word or idea this morning, I think the key word which only appears a few times is imagination. Today we're thinking about uh, big changes that we might make and how they all begin in our imagination if we can imagine things differently. And it starts with a story uh, from right here in Charleston, uh, a story that took place not very long ago. The title of this teaching is A Long Time Coming. It had been a long time coming. The statue had been erected in 1887 then put on its high pedestal in 1896. Black Charlestonians had long despised it. The man it honored had called their enslavement a positive good. It was an eyesore, towering over the center of the city, a constant reminder of the racism that had defined and divided us. As long as the statue had been there, good people had held it in contempt. For years it was spat on and derided. Petitions for its removal were signed. Many of you added your signatures just last year. Yet no action was taken. In a state littered with monuments to enslavers and confederates, the statue of John C. Calhoun was particularly offensive. It imposed itself into our sky and cast a shadow over all of us. We had begun to think that we would never see it come down. We would just do our part of the work and perhaps one day, after we were gone, some child would walk through Marion Square without ever having to see a white supremacist enshrined there. Yet the moment came when the country had had enough. More murders, this time of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and others. A pandemic that kept us cooped up, ready to boil over. Until we did. The protests went worldwide. They even reached our city council, who seized the moment to bring Calhoun down once and for all, it had been a long time coming. We'd gone to bed without knowing and woke early to a text from a friend. It's coming down, she said. Without thinking, we dressed quickly, drank half a cup of coffee and left. We drove to Marion Square where we parked and got out to see for ourselves. We pulled on our masks I fished for my camera. One of us was still wearing a pajama top. Our hope had been that if we went early enough, we could glimpse something historic 
before the crowds arrived. We were still vulnerable during the pandemic and in need of physical distance. Fortunately, few were there at such an early hour. Many had grown weary after wading through the night and had gone home. In the end, crews would spend nearly 17 hours trying to remove the embedded statue, but none of us knew that at the time. We watched for half an hour or so. It was calm and relatively quiet. The morning sun glinted off the dewy grass of the square. People stood and pointed. Someone sang softly. Then I caught sight of an image I'll never forget. Two black Charlestonians had set lawn chairs at the fence that cordoned off the base of the statue. They had drawn as close as they could get, and they brought a picnic. They spoke with each other, laughing and looking up. They wanted to see Calhoun come down, and they were willing to wait. It had been a long time coming. We left after a short time, but I don't doubt those two black friends stayed until the very end. I imagine they stayed not only for themselves, but for their ancestors, for all the generations of black people who had been forced to walk in the shadow of that statue. What was so harmful about Calhoun was that everyone knew what the symbol stood for, and yet it was tolerated for so long. We all knew he was a racist. We all knew what he said. We all knew when the statue had been put up and what message it sent, and yet people made excuses. It was explained to us that it would be too difficult to change. The symbol would have to stand. More than anything, I am struck by the lack of imagination. The fact that so many of us couldn't see ourselves, couldn't see our city otherwise. It reminded me of another struggle I've been involved in for decades now. I became aware of it in the 1970s and 1980s as the Baptist congregations in which I was raised fought over gender equality in the church. My parents were on the side of treating women equally and opening ordination to all. We chose churches that ordained women as deacons and ministers. And as a part of that commitment, we began to open up our language. Churches committed to equality began to work at dismantling one of the most deeply entrenched symbols of all namely that of a male God. We began to change our language, leaving behind male pronouns that always pictured God in a single gendered way. We began to open our imaginations to the ideas of God that went beyond simple personification. We began to learn that if we changed our language, and our symbols, then we ourselves began to change in dramatic ways. It had been a long time coming. After having grown up in this way, I went off to seminary, worked as a chaplain, did doctoral work, and have spent my entire vocational life in the church, all without ever calling God by a male pronoun. I've always been grateful to the Baptists who freed me of that old and limited idea of a God fashioned in my image, namely an explicitly male image, and also an implicitly white and straight one. Yet I've also been troubled by the fact that I hear others refer to God in male terms almost every day. In my work, I hear public officials, colleagues, and church folk talk about God in male terms. It always catches me for a moment 
pulls me into an unimaginative place and curtails the conversation. When someone refers to God in male terms, I don't honestly know what they mean. I don't assume that they mean God is actually a man, but using male symbols and images doesn't give me anything else to go on. As you know from my writing and preaching, I prefer a variety of symbols and images because I believe God is essentially a mystery to be approached with humility and respect. And I display this preference by wording the pastoral prayer differently every week. I'm not sure I've ever called God the same thing twice. Why would I? And I'm not doing this in an attempt to be clever. I'm doing it in an attempt to be reverent. I think often of the story of Moses in the burning bush. The story is full of symbols. The bush burns but is not consumed as a sign. Moses hears a voice and removes his sandals. The place and the moment are deemed holy, and he receives there a kind of revelation. I read the story symbolically, not literally, but the symbols are the heart of the matter. In fact, the God character in the story argues forcefully against the symbol for God being understood too easily. When the God character assures Moses that God will be with Moses and that Moses should bring a word to the people, Moses asks for God's name. But who should I say you are, Moses asks. And in one of the most delightful passages in scripture, God won't really say. Rather than giving a name, God says that God will be whomever and whatever God is. And that's that. In the King James Version, familiar to most English speakers, God famously says, I am that I am. That's my name. Yet in Robert Alter's brilliant translation of the Hebrew, God says something even better. According to Alter, the most plausible rendering of the Hebrew is, I will be who I will be. Not only does the word will add a future orientation, but it also strikes a note of affirmation and trust, even if God resists definition. So from the top, it sounds like this. Moses wants to know God's name, and God evades the question. God says simply, I will be who I will be, and then continues, that is how you invoke me. And if that doesn't strike you funny, then maybe it should. God essentially tells Moses that God may be invoked by not knowing God's precise name. God is who God is. God will be who God will be, not constricted, not boxed in, not ever fully known or named. That's how you know it's God. I often wonder why the symbol of a male God persists. I know our English Bibles do a disservice to the Hebrew by not rendering the word for God unpronounceable as they did, and by using male pronouns throughout. I know Western Christianity has been deeply patriarchal, which closely mirrors Western culture. I know that sexism is as real as racism, that women continue to suffer its effects in every sphere, from the home, to the workplace, to the church. Yet I still believe that we can do the work of freeing ourselves from that old symbol of a God who is so constricted, so limited, so small as to be referred to as a man. The God I believe in is not a man, and I'm not able to refer to God in such a way. 
Some days I feel I'm still waiting for others to join me. I've set out a lawn chair in front of that old symbol, waiting for it to finally be removed. It sure has been a long time coming. What I have learned is that if we change the way we speak, then we change the way we think. And once we change the way we think, then we ourselves begin to change. And just as I now celebrate that no black child in Charleston will walk beneath Calhoun's statue ever again, one day I hope that no girl in the church will have to walk in the shadow of a male god. Because we're trying to build a city and a church where there is room for everybody and where everybody can find themselves reflected and celebrated. But it all begins with the hard work of removing some of the things that have been embedded for so long. Friends, we do this work not because we are trying to be liberal or correct in a certain way, but because we are trying to be religious in a certain way. Because we know that our symbols can either expand our imaginations or constrict them. They can either include all of us or exclude some of us. So beginning today, if you haven't already left the old male God behind, in your thoughts, in your speech, in your life, then I invite you to begin the process of doing that. Set up a lawn chair, bring a picnic, join us as we talk, laugh, and look up. Once the old symbol has been removed, we may find that it was blocking our view all along, we may find that there is so much more we can see. Amen. Friends, now is the time in our service when we collect the offering. And as we do, we always remind each other that the money we collect is used to support our church, which is a house of welcome for all people, and also to support our work for justice and peace in the world outside our walls. Uh, we are grateful for everyone who gives so generously of their money, their time, and their energy to the work of our church. I'd also like to remind you that we have a COVID-19 relief fund. If you or someone you know in the circular community has an economic need uh, due to the hardship that we're all going through during this pandemic, please reach out to me or any member of the church staff confidentially. We do have grant money uh, that we would like to get to people 
uh, who might be helped by a little funding. So uh, please reach out and let us know. We'd like to get funds uh, where they'd be most helpful. And in that spirit, uh, we're invited to give. And as we give, we pray that all of our resources um, would extend love and care to each other and to the larger community. As I invite you to join me in the pastoral prayer, I also invite you to reach out and let us know how you're doing. Uh, we're trying to connect with each other, but we don't always know um, 
how everyone is doing. So if you have a joy, a concern, or a need, just, just reach out and we'll do our best to care for each other during this time. It is not an easy time. So take care of yourself, uh, but reach out and let us know how you're doing. And in that spirit, I invite you to join me in a moment of prayer. To the God who resists definition, we pray our thanks for the ways you remind us that all our attempts to reduce what is holy, to confine what is sacred, to control what is divine are as hapless as Moses asking the mystery for its name. Help us, we pray, to learn new ways to imagine who and what you are. Help us to find and claim the language of our own experience, our burning bushes, our voices heard, our moments of slipping off our sandals and feeling the hum of the earth when we stumble to name our reverence before it all. Help us to take down every oppressive symbol, every false idol and every small idea that blocks our horizon and distorts our view. And as we pray this, we pray the many joys and concerns of our hearts. We pray for all who are lonely today, struggling through this time. We pray for all who are grieving today for an old loss or for a new one. We pray for everyone who struggles with addiction today and finds it more challenging during the pandemic. We pray for those in recovery doing their best each day. We pray for all those who are sick, for all of our medical caregivers, God, give them strength. And we pray for all the world's peacemakers. Be with them during these days. And we hold in prayer so many other things that we carry quietly with us. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught you by his living and his stories and his way. We remember him, give thanks, and pray together the prayer that he taught us.
Friends, as we go from here, let us remember what's at stake. In our stories and symbols and language, we can either expand our imaginations or constrict them. We can either include everybody or leave some of us out. The choice is up to us. Amen.